Four years ago, maybe five years ago, just in the early stages of launching the idea of Dali Association, I got a call from NGO Annapolis that I'll never forget. It's one of those calls that makes you realize something that changes the way that you see things thereafter. The woman who called is a powerful, dynamic, committed NGO leader. And she'd heard about our work mobilizing resources for civil society, and she asked me to help her find money. So I said, for what? She said, we need to pay doctors to give health lectures to women. Does anybody catch how bizarre that is? How wrong that is? Does anybody understand what's wrong with that? Any ideas? OK, she wanted money to pay doctors to give health lectures. She didn't have money, but she has doctors. Palestine has lots of doctors. So why do we focus on the thing that we don't have rather than the thing we do have, which is resources, lots of resources? Not long after, I was invited to a village near Ramallah to a, to a women's committee. And the leader of the women's committee introduced me. This is Nura uh, Murad from Asis Danya. And she wants to know what our needs are. I said, no, please. I know what your needs are. I've done needs assessments all over Palestine. You need education and jobs and sanitation and equality and personal safety. And I went down the list, and there was silence. Embarrassing. Well, OK, why did you come? I said, I came to find out what your resources are and your capacities and your assets and how we can mobilize them together. There was a long silence, but I'm very comfortable with silence. Finally, someone from the back said, well, do you mean like we know how to cook? And I said, yes, write it down. Well, do you mean like we know how to farm? I said, yes, write it down. And in five minutes, we had pages of capacities and resources and assets. And at the end of the meeting, they told me, no one has ever asked us that question before. These conversations and many, many other real sad examples have led me to the conclusion that despite the good intentions of many, despite all our good intentions, that the international aid system actually promotes inequality. It promotes inequality by dividing Palestinians and the world, I should say, into givers and receivers, as you see here. Givers are generous, active, worthy. Receivers are needy and passive and dependent. Palestinians are receivers. Some of you may have read the book Dead Aid by Denby Samoyo. It's not a perfect book, but one thing I appreciate is she says in her book that aid is the cause of poverty in Africa. Not a side product, but the cause. And the reason why I like that is because we're stuck in this language of aid effectiveness, as if, we've said today, aid could be effective under occupation. So let's ask ourselves the question, if international aid is part of Palestinian oppression. Now here we could talk about fault. We could say that donors know that billions of dollars of investment in Palestine haven't produced results. But they keep giving, and they keep giving in ways that are wasteful and insulting. Or we could say that Palestinians have sold out, that the NGOs are competing with one another for contracts so they can implement donors' agendas while local priorities are ignored. There's probably truth in both perspectives. But I think there's also truth in saying that the system is broken 
and that donors and Palestinians alike, and some of us who are neither, recognize the problem and are anxious for solutions and alternatives that lead to real Palestinian-led social change and sustainable development. We have to get beyond complaining, which is easy, and I'm very good at it, into problem solving, which is really hard. But I want to remind us all that it hasn't always been this way. How many people here remember the first intifada? I don't mean heard of it, but remember it. And that's an important question, because if you're under like 30, which a lot of folks in here are, you may not remember. And those of you who were here yesterday, there was a question from a young woman about how will new graduates get jobs if aid goes away? That question comes from someone who doesn't remember the first intifada. Because in the first intifada, Palestinians didn't focus on the thing they don't have, money, but on what they do have, resources. And everybody gave. Doctors, maybe some of you, treated people in their homes. Teachers, maybe some of you, taught people in their homes. Just thinking about it reminds me of an old American black activist who, as she recalled the days of the civil rights movement in America, told me, if you couldn't march in the demonstration, you made the sandwiches. Everyone had a role to play. Everyone's role was important. And no one asked, how much are you going to pay me? Those days are just as much a part of Palestinian culture, Palestinian identity, Palestinian psyche, as are today the days of individualism and materialism and, one could say, hopelessness. How can we return to these day, those days? We don't need to return because actually giving is alive and well in Palestine today, although it's not always celebrated or visible. Let me show you some of Palestine's givers. On your left, you have Sadi. He's 11 years old. For three years, his last three birthdays, he invited his friends to celebrate his birthday party and said, please don't bring birthday gifts. Bring money so that we can gather it together and give it to a child who doesn't have the same kinds of toys and opportunities that we have. On your right, on the top, is Leila, who was at Sadi's party. She's turning nine now, and this is her second year inviting her friends to her birthday party and saying, please don't bring me gifts. Katerina was at Sally's party. She's on year two. And Jassy, on the far right, that's my daughter. She's 11, and she's also on the second year. They go to each other's birthday parties and love the idea of being givers. Because being a giver is to be human. It's to be part of the solution. It's normal. And how about these folks here? On the left, you've got a Kalindeka group from Nablus. They didn't have the funds they needed to buy costumes so they could perform in the Nablus festival. On the right, you have, you have Wishak, Debka group of Ramallah, who loaned Akalil the costumes so that Akalil could dance in the festival. These creative uses of existing local resources aren't as rare as we might think. And there's also, of course, lots of traditional charity to poor people. A lot of it is religiously motivated. But this ad hoc self-initiated giving isn't enough. Palestinians need a system of philanthropy that's robust enough to counter the negative effects of a system of aid. And over time, to decrease dependence on aid. I don't say we should eliminate aid. First of all, we need it. Second of all, we're entitled to it. And, uh, but I do think we should decrease dependence on aid. Because when you have choices, and you make choices, you have self-determination. But when you have no choices, then you are uh, less than. So first of all, what's in the system of Palestinian philanthropy? So first of all, down on the far right here, we have local decision-making. Delhi Association has this crazy idea. It's 
completely insane, I know, but the idea is that Palestinians should make their own development decisions. Crazy. The idea is they'll not only make better decisions, but that it's their right to decide how to use their own development resources. I don't mean participation, I don't mean community consultation, I don't mean focus groups and needs assessments. All of those, in my opinion, are usually window dressing because at the end of the day, I've done this work, they take my work, they go back to Tokyo or Belgium or Norway and decide what the intervention will be. Okay? Palestinians only get to decide what the problem is, what the need is, but not the solution. What we're talking about is actual control over how resources are used. That's self-determination. Let me give you a little example. If I give you a $500 gift card that you can use at Bravo Supermarket, you'll use that card to buy good things, maybe food or cleaning supplies or whatever other nice things they have at the, at the Bravo. But if I give you $500 in cash, you're going to go home and think about what your priorities are. And you might send your son to school. You might buy some, some supplies to open a small store in your home. Lots of things you might do. So that's what happens when donors earmark $10,000 for a democracy workshop. A hall is rented. Trainers are hired. Participants <laughs> eat food. And they get certificates. None of that is bad in and of itself. But neither does it speak to Palestinian priorities. And so there is no local commitment and there's no long-term impact. Happily, it turns out that Palestinians have a right to control their own resources. So, Dali Association is not so crazy after all. We combed through the Paris Declaration, Accra, Monterey, treaties and conventions as far back as Geneva, and we found that Palestinians do have a right, and that donors do have obligations, as Ingrid was saying, to give aid in a way that respects Palestinian priorities. So, did you know that states have a positive obligation to help others gain their right to self-determination, including economic development? That's from the UN Charter. Did you know that, quote, aid actors should ensure all activities do no harm, unquote? That's from Principles for Good International Engagement in Fragile States. How about, quote, the provision of economic and technical assistance, loans, and increased foreign investment must not be subject to conditions which conflict with the interests of the recipient state. That's a General Assembly resolution. And from Paris Declaration, we recommit to reforming and simplifying donor policies and procedures to encourage collaborative behavior and progressive alignment with partner countries, priorities, systems, and procedures. All of these are listed in the brochure that Dalia has published, and I can send it to you. If you give me your card, I can email it to you. My very favorite is from ACRA Agenda. It says, donors resolve to work together to help countries across the world build the successful future all of us want to see. A future based on a shared commitment to overcome poverty, a future in which no countries will depend on aid. So in the meantime, local decision making helps Palestinians claim their right to control their own uh, resources. And then we have over here on the left, local monitoring. I don't mean log frames, and I don't mean in a technical sense monitoring. What I mean is that Palestinian communities monitor the activities of civil society. Only through this monitoring can communities hold civil society accountable and hold them accountable for respecting local priorities. Right now, as you know, NGOs get grants from international organizations, and they report back to the donor. There's no way that the community could know what were done with the funds or what was accomplished, although the funds were supposedly received on their behalf. So Daniel believes in establishing local monitoring committees that keep track of every grant. At first, the grantees feel very intruded upon. Why should we have to show our financial records and answer questions of this group of community members? But through the process and with Dali's support, 
the uh, grantees realize that it's not their money, but money they received on behalf of the community, and that it's to the community they're accountable. And community me members begin to realize that NGOs can't be accountable to them until they're funded by them. When the community funds the NGOs, the NGOs will be accountable to the community. NGOs or other civil society organizations or informal civil society. And in this context, community philanthropy begins to make sense. And then over time, we need to develop systems for giving. You know, in the U.S., for example, where I'm from, an NGO will send a request in the mail for money, and I can write a check and put it back in the mail, or go on the computer and enter my credit card, or I can even text a contribution to the NGO. In Palestine, checks, credit cards, even the mail, nothing works here. To let, get a local contribution, and some of you here have given, we need to go with our receipt book to you, get cash, give you a receipt, and take that cash to the bank. It's really hard. It's really cumbersome. And in the U.S. and other places where philanthropy thrives, there are tax benefits to giving, and there's regulation that ensures the NGOs are, you know, legal. All these systems increase trust and make giving easier and more rewarding. As we develop our own system for philanthropy here in Palestine, over time, Palestinians will develop a culture and giver as givers, and all the pride and dignity that go with it. Unfortunately, it's hard to start there at the top with the giving. We have to build trust first. Trust in our institutions, trust in ourselves as decision makers. We need to value our rights in aid in order to claim them and stop being victims so we can take responsibility. And this is the vision that led a group of Palestinians uh, to found Dali Association, which is the first Palestinian community foundation. Dali Association facilitates community-controlled grant making, where communities decide themselves how to invest their resources in their own community institutions. They monitor it, and the community, the grantees report back to the community. Um, there have been pilots uh, in several villages and cities all over the West Bank, and the process is absolutely transformational. When people decide how to use their own money, they're thoughtful and strategic and responsible. And if they waste it, it's their right. But they don't. They waste other people's money, not their own. Delhi also promotes philanthropy. I'll just mention two innovative examples. One are hometown funds, where any of you, wherever you live in the world, can open a fund for your hometown. It could be in Bisan, it could be in Jaffa, it could be in, in Gaza, it could be here in the West Bank. And you gather together folks from all over the world, whether they live in Bahrain or Chicago or South Africa, from your hometown, and everyone puts in $10, $100, $1,000, and when it builds up to the approximately $15,000 or whatever amount we need for that location, we'll implement community-controlled grant making in that place. It can also be in honor of a village that's been destroyed. Um, and then lastly, claiming rights and aid. Dali Association has done 150 in-person interviews, plus about 15 focus groups all over the West Bank, Gaza, and inside 1948 to, to articulate what demands we want from donors. So that while we continue to need aid, we can modify and reform the aid system so that better supports us in meeting local priorities and being accountable to local communities. The first workshops were a lot of complaining, and that's important. They complained about, you know, humanitarian aid versus development aid. They complained about the use of intermediaries. They complained about lots of important things. But then we transformed the dialogue from complaint to demand so that folks could say, what is it that we want donors to do different? I think a lot of donors in the room would like to have that information, and so we'll be um, releasing that soon. Um, there's so much more I could tell you, but, um, but I don't have time. So let me tell you that there is information on the literature table outside. There's the Daily brochure, and there's an article that I wrote called uh, Community Philanthropy in Aid-Dependent Palestine. It's 
because people say how can people give when they're dependent on aid. And we also have information about a corporate um, philanthropy program that's being launched now. Again, promoting philanthropy, very important to self-determination in an aid process. Only one more second. The last thing I want you to do is to engage in dialogue with other givers in Palestine about creative ideas, sustainable ideas, and come to us. If you're not sure here who the givers are in Palestine, if you're not sure who here is a giver, then here they are. These are Palestine's givers. I took this picture of you yesterday. You're very nice looking. Because, um, my people, uh, politics is difficult and politics are hard, but um, community philanthropy can be developed even in an aid-dependent society, and that while there's lots of giving in Palestine, without solid systems, philanthropy cannot be strategic, accountable, and sustainable. And, lastly, it will take time for these innovations in community philanthropy to take root. So, sincere givers, local and international, will want to invest not only in development, but also in philanthropy and over the long term. And with your help, together, we will move from this aid system, which is very complex, very wasteful, very dehumanizing, we'll move to this. Thank you very much.